Hello, everybody. I'm coming down to the uh, graveyard shift, so I've got to keep you awake now. Um, I'm going to talk about the alchemy of resilience. Everything that um, everybody who's preceded me has talked about has been about uh, focusing on risk and putting it down into smaller areas. Um, what I'm looking at is um, how things change. Now they change so quickly that we need to prepare for the unknown. Something that Darwin said, not the strongest, it's not the most intelligent, it's the one that responds quickly and most responsive to change. And this is why I wish I hadn't put so much um, little bits in my uh, presentation. Right, currently um, we're working on risk management. And if you look at the risk categories there, Kaplan, who has come from uh, Harvard Business, he has now changed the process of risk management. He's looking at Cat 1, which is preventable risk. And everything that everybody's been talking about here is how to prevent the risk. And as we move forward, we've got to look at risk in different ways. So Cat 2 is strategic risk. So companies and countries need to look at their strategic risk when they're moving forward. And cap three is the external risk. And there's the risk that is unknown and what we've got to prepare for, which is unknown. So when we're looking at horizon scanning, so picture now that any company looking to go into Asia on a market has to look at these three categories separately. And there's three areas that we can look at. There's the area, uh, the circle of influence. That circle of influence is about the preventative measures that we can already take, and take. Now, if you look at what all my colleagues over here have been talking about, they're focusing on a threat, the risk, and then the prevention within that area. And it's something that, that Kaplan's saying that we can deal with. The areas that we have to look at is the strategic risk is the risk that we're going to accept to go to the next level, the next horizon. And then there's the external risk, which is then the issues of the unknown and how to respond to those issues. What resilience do we have when something happens that we don't know about? If we look at the risk universe, it's huge, the global risk Everything that's being talked about is just one of those dots on there. You're scanning that horizon when either you're looking at the infrastructure or you're looking at the uh, next move into the, uh, for UK companies moving into Asia. They've got to identify those risks. But that is just a blur. That, a lot of that is not in their field of view. But if you look now, has everybody heard about MIRS-V? Middle East respiratory syndrome virus, which is already starting to develop within Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, and it's now a form of concern. At the moment, there's little likelihood and there's little threat because it's very small. But how long will it take till it becomes a threat to the rest of the world? If you look at the top 10 threats in Asia, the top 10 trends it's actually seven, it's 36%, and this is from the Global Risk Survey, are looking at pandemics as being a massive issue towards their infrastructure. If you look over on the top 10 threats, at five and eight is counter-terrorism or terrorism action or security issues. So which one do you focus on? And I think that's where we're talking now about critical activities. So Harry himself has already spoken about the threat to the energy. We're also talking about threat to, uh, sorry, uh, the National Security Advisor is talking about threat to energy security, food security, technology, social cohesion. And all these issues 
And all these risks are building and building. But where do they come on your risk assessment? What do you focus on? Because they're huge. The key as well is all I've heard is protection. Protect, protect, protect. But once the issue happens, once the threat's taken place, once the crisis starts, what do you do? How many people here within their organisations have actually got a business continuity plan? Policy. We've got one, two. How many people have actually practised that business continuity plan in the last 12 months? One, two. And it's something that's been talked about by Graham is, if you don't test it, how do you know it works? It's critical. As the, as the, as the floods start entering now, I put this in. What a disaster in uh, India, which continually is occurring. But what is it doing to the infrastructure? If you look here, every single one of those vehicles is part of a supply chain. That supply chain is a tier two or tier three supplier to a tier one supplier who's now having disruption within that business area, which is now failing. What is the continuity plan for that? What is the resilience within the organisation? So Kaplan then talks about strategic risk. And this is the core. When we're looking at strategic risk, he's saying that we should look at the first core, the first horizon, that should be defended. That critical infrastructure of the either country, the organisation. And if we want to move forward and to be able to survive, we've got to go out and take strategic risk to be able to then move forward. And the strategic risk, or horizon two, sorry, will then become horizon one. But would you use the same risk management program and business continuity program and risk assessment for Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 as you would for Horizon 1? Are they different? So this then brings us down to the critical activities. The critical activities a threat to your core business. And what we're saying here is if you look on the micro threat, the cat one threat, we need a resilience plan to make sure that that is protected. Now, examples of that are any government body, um, or let's look at BP. BP, Deep Horizon, Deep Water Horizon. Everything that was going on there was a preventable threat but they failed to follow their policies and processes and test them, which then caused them $32, million, $32 billion, sorry. And how bad was that on their brand reputation? When we're looking at threats and the critical activities, and we now look at the circles of concern, which is the macro threat, how do we ensure that the people are in our supply chain actually have the continuity and the resilience that we have ourselves and our suppliers. What Kaplan's saying, again, is that we need to treat these risks separately as well. And if you look at organisations, if it's preventable, it comes out at the end of an, interview, at the end of an inquiry. How many governments have now fallen foul to saying, this was preventable, you could have seen it. Um, the Mendez shooting from the Metropolitan Police in London. 32 million, dollars later, million pounds later, five inquiries. They stated that this could have been prevented. But the signals and noises that were being fulfilled and all coming out weren't taken. We'd had UK bombings, we'd had UK suicide bombers going to Israel. We'd had a suicide bomber on a plane flying from Paris over to uh, New York, we had um, people setting up in, um, sorry, in, in uh, Beeston, there was something like 12 targets already being looked at, yet nothing 
was actually carried forward. Those signals and noises, the UK actually reduced their threat assessment prior, seven days prior to the 7 and 7 bombings. When we're looking at strategic risk, that strategic risk is about probability. We've got to, if we're looking to take that step and take that risk, we've got to look at the probability of it occurring and how do we reduce that probability? External, again, we're looking at impact. We know it's going to happen at some point, but what do we have in our arsenal to defend the core business against any external threat? And there's lots and lots of those we could talk about and has been talked about. So, how do we do that? If you look now, organisations going forward. We've looked at ISOs. Everyone understand their um, international standards? Has any organisations got any international standards? As in ISO two, uh, uh, 9001? Yeah? If you look in India alone now, there's 38,000 companies that have now got ISO 9001. Why? Because that sets a standard for the supply chain. What happens then? Everything's working fine, and then lightning strikes. The first thing that happens on a critical incident is the impact on the business, whether that's country or company. That impact then sets off a chain, and you've got to deal with that quickly. The first thing that's required, crisis management. Business continuity. Disaster recovery. Where's that happening at the moment in India? At the floods up the north of the country. Right now, right, is there enough resilience within the military to be able to deal with what's occurring at that northern hemisphere, at northern uh, site? If we then set up systems within the business area and set recovery point objectives and test the crisis management, test the business continuity and test the uh, disaster recovery, we then reduce the disruption, reduce the impact of the event, more importantly, for companies, they're looking at loss of revenue and reduction of share prices. And that's, again, we can look at BP and numerous organisations that are failing on that. How do we deal with that then? So where we are now is that we've, we understand the threat. We understand how to uh, identify the risk. We understand how now to evaluate it. But do we actually put it in practice? Do we do a gap analysis on what the current systems are? And do you actually test the systems? How do you prove their worth? How do you prove the return on investment? So there's a lot of questions here. And the first thing, how many, I'm just doing a quick survey here. How many people have ever done a business impact assessment on their business or their, their uh, area of responsibility? I'm doing a master's programme at the moment, so I'm just trying to find out if it's actually out there. No? What does a business impact analysis do? That then identifies your critical activities within your business, identifies what will be disrupted and how long it will be disrupted for, and then what levels of response you require to be able to get back business working. So if we go back to... Um, the government building in India that burnt down, 63,000 documents burnt in June 2012. We're now in February, and it's report, oh, it was in February that it was reported that only 6,000 of those documents had actually been rebuilt to be able to go back into the business area. So they weren't able, they didn't have the resilience to continue to what they were doing. So, 
What we've worked on now is we've looked at, we've been asked about uh, total quality management. I've worked with a number of ministries in Iraq, etc., looking to try and get the OSO standards to be able to then go into international market. And what's been identified in, over the last two years, um, while we've been on our master's programmes, etc., is that organisations now need corporate resilience. We look at the protection, the protection's there, right? But what happens when something happens? What do you do? How do you respond? So we're looking now to actually make that from a negative to a positive. Because if you look at the supply chain, where the suppliers and the purchasers need to come together is to identify how they're going to work together to eliminate the disruptions within the supply chain. Something that um, was discussed throughout uh, today as well is that Different cultures have different things. So different standards mean different things to different people. And what we're looking at is to customise. And we customise the solutions to fit the market, fit the individuals, and fit the organisations. And more importantly, they're co-created. It's not just um, the subject matter expert coming in. It's working with the key stakeholders within either the national infrastructure or the local infrastructure or company level to make sure it's the solution that they want and that they work to. Key to this is as well that it's certified and accredited. What's that mean? It means it gives them competitive advantage after everything's happened. So they go through the process, they're now proving that they have their worth and their standard and that they're certified for when they're going for tender. And for when a, a purchaser comes and sees them, this is fantastic because it means they've already reached the levels on their assessment processes. And one of the things that can work here is corporate social responsibility. Key suppliers are now going into India, we've been working in Africa, Central America, etc. But going into the local suppliers and setting up their infrastructure to the standards, international standards, to allow them to work within the supply chain. That supply chain then, it, for the tier one supplier, that reduces their risk while also sorting out the infrastructure within the, the country and then that gives back to the company, the countries that they're working in. So you have a localization planning. Something that we've worked on down in Africa, in Tanzania, in Zambia and in Central America. And it's worked really well because the supply chain becomes stronger and the disruption becomes less. Externally tested and verified, which is critical. Old stains when I was in the military, if it's not tested, it's not done. If you don't test the facility and don't test the process, how do you know it works? And the only time you know it works is when after the incident has occurred. And it needs to be that it's tested externally because you have what's called group thing. So everybody goes, yeah, it's fine, it all works great. But Unless somebody else comes in and talks to you and shows you and demonstrates and evidences to you that it is failing, how do you improve? The key to this as well is lessons learned. If an action happens or an incident happens, you have to learn from that lesson. You have to take that risk, but what do you learn from it? This process takes it through. And where we're looking as well is that taking organisations and countries to be able to have them a competitive advantage. India's versus China, UK versus America. I've worked in the Middle East, we're always fighting against either the Americans or the Australians in the education world to see who's the better standard. And the, the, the next thing is the return on investment, and something that Graham said there, 600 million. If it never goes wrong, how do you prove it's gone right? How do you evaluate and understand the return on investment? Using what we call the Kirkpatrick's um, levels of uh, evaluation, we can prove statistically that what the exercises have done has actually increased your performance. And it can also look where you're actually, you, you can lean, uh, manage your business area. Because if you can do it with six or seven, and you've currently got 10 or 11 doing it, why can't you reduce your costs on that if you can do it in that, in that uh, series? So, 
We're working um, quite closely now with uh, accredited and approval bodies, with IQ and Ray Clark's over there, the MD of that, where we're looking now, and what we've understood through all our uh, global work, is that we need to focus on customising these systems to be able to work with the individuals and the companies that we're working for. And we're working with uh, insurance underwriters to be able to say, right, you need to be able to standardise these uh, when you're insuring companies. You, you need to be able to standardise what level of resilience they have because a lot of the supply chain and the supply managers, what they're insisted on is that there's some sort of certification and accreditation to be able to firstly um, take them on as suppliers. So we're working using the ISO models at the moment, but something was pointed out that we can't use... Um, the Americans have different systems, the Australians have different systems, um, Central America have different systems, etc. But what we've learned from the educational world is we can take models and um, we can take, sorry, um, units from that and competencies and make them into one specific solution for the client. So it works through. So key on this is that you look at your current competencies and capabilities and those competencies and capabilities are set to be able to get you competitive advantage. They're certified through an external body. That gives you credibility then to be able to walk into tender. The next level we're looking at is competencies to work in a specific sector. Now, if you look at um, events, we talked about the Olympics, there's now a, a sustainable event, steward, uh, event management, which is specific for Olympics, etc. But anybody wanting to, to supply to the Olympics should be having that ISO to be able to tender. And then specifically, we're looking at tender specific. When we're walking in, what is required to be able to win that tender? And one of those key things nowadays is social responsibility. And you have to prove that concept. And um, with that level, we can then take you up to a gold standard, which then allows you greater access to the market. Finishing off then, um, what we've looked at is how to identify the risk, how to assess it, but more importantly, what do we do to verify this and certify it? How do you prove outside of your organization what capabilities and competencies you have? And if you don't have that resilience through testing and proving through certification, how do you prove that you've got the resilience to weather the next storm? That's the end of the, um, the question. Am I just in time? I was rushing. But what I would just like to say is we're just finishing off. Um, through uh, our Indian partners and Darkstar, etc., we're currently doing a thesis, uh, myself and John Butterfield over there, and we're just trying to identify, to break down these barriers through um, some research on what are the uh, perceptions of the supply chains. Because what we need to know is, the UK over here, we've identified, they have to have the Bribery Act, they have to do A, B and C. India say we're going into that market, what does the supplier need, right? And once we can get that data, we can identify what the threats are to that supply chain, and then we can uh, educate both sides to be able to merge correctly. So what we're asking for is if anybody's interested and could come and work with us on this, um, we're down at Dark Star. If you could come and speak to us, and we're looking to get sort of um, data sources from individuals, just doing an online uh, research program for us. Is anybody interested? Don't come at once. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.